Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Second and Saints. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday morning. I'm sure you got plenty of other things that you probably could be doing, but, you know, thank you no. for taking the time. No, there's yeah, exactly. nothing else you could be doing but this. Thank yes. you very much for being here. <laughs> Ross coming with the, from the top rope. I love it. I love the energy this morning for sure, man. Hey. It's, it is what it is. So, no, we really do appreciate it, and guys. And don't forget to like and subscribe. We're growing on this channel. We're growing as a show. So a lot of fun stuff happening. But, Ross, how was the weekend? You were at French Quarter Fest. I imagine that was pretty dull and lame, right? <laughs> no, it was so much fun. It was really good. Um, it took me forever to find something to eat. But other than that, it was great. Got to mm. spend some time with some great folks, Kat, Ryan, Mike, Dan, uh, and others. It was awesome. So it was a really, really good time uh, being able to be out there. I love being in the city. love being able to be out and about. And I love this part of the season with all the festivals and everything going on. Uh, it's 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 the perfect season. The perfect season. How's everything going for you, man? It's going, man. It's uh, a little bit tired. I tired, but, you know, I was in Luling yesterday for my son's field trip. And so uh, he had a, a thing at Cajun airboat tour, raging Cajun airboat tours in Luling. Oh, so yeah. that's pretty cool. Got to see a 10 foot, 12 foot gator up close and personal about as close as I want to ever get to it in the wild. You know? I mean, <laughs> like, I'm talking about like right there, the boat is the only thing separating for me between this guy and he's like blind in one eye and stuff. And then there was another one that was blind. So pretty, uh, pretty wild, but man, everything's been going good. And, you know, Saints wise, two for almost a week away from the draft. It's crazy. Oh my goodness, you know, um, man. It's next week so is great. yeah, next week's gonna be crazy. You know, uh, you know, just to give everybody some perspective, you know, we'll talk to to Mickey at some point next week and mm -hmm. get his input and and then when the draft happens, you know, we'll be over at the facility on airline and basically what happens is we're there until they make a pick and then you know, we'll hear from DA or Mickey at the end of the night, and then we'll talk to the prospect that they end up choosing. And so draft is the hot button right now but you know before we dive in because the main thing that we're going to tackle today is we did some mock drafts we did two round mock drafts we did two each we're going to compare we have no idea who we picked but we're going to talk about it and such but before we get there let's kind of tarantino a little bit and kind of start from the backwards and, and work our way to the front but shamar g and charles team re-signed him recently I think uh, when you look at it, it's not one of those moves, of course, that's going to set the world on fire. But this is a guy who came in. He was picked up. He played with the San Francisco 49ers last year, originally a draft pick of the Packers. Mm -hmm. Played special teams late in the year. Special teams matter. They lost special Isaac Yedem. They lost Zach Bond. They lost a bunch of guys there. You've spoken to Shamar Jean Charles a little bit. What, give us a little bit of insight on him and, and kind of what they're getting out of this player and what his outlook could be. Yeah, I like Shamar a lot. He's a good dude. Um, just high energy and brings a lot of energy to the field as well. Loves playing special teams. Uh, you know, is a cornerback by trait as well, of course. Uh, but, I mean, he was somebody that came in and played immediately toward the end of the season, like 60-plus snaps. He was like 68 snaps on special teams, which if you're looking at it from a per-game basis, that's a pretty heavy workload uh, for somebody that wasn't added until very, very late in the season. He comes out yeah. of uh, App State and everything too. So it, it, it's a good selection or a good good signing for new Orleans. Again, it's not one of those ones that's going to, you know, blow the doors off of the facility or anything like that, but these are the types of signings that build your roster. And these are the types of players that you want to have around that are going to be able to come in, especially when you've had so much attrition of the guys that contribute on special teams, you want to be able to bring some more of those guys in. And Shamar John Charles is somebody that will come in and bring that and already has experience doing it for New Orleans. I know he made a couple of hits on some special teams plays toward the end of the season in the Superdome where you and I turned and looked at each other like, my goodness. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's the thing is Isaac Yedem was not a guy when you when he signed, nobody mm -hmm. cared, right? right? Like in all respect to him, but he balled out and you know his lineage with Joe Woods and Marcus Robertson obviously helped him out a good bit. But Shamar's a guy that man, he could come in here and, and be a guy that plays the role in the Saints, you know, aside Marshawn, which again we've talked about it plenty. Marshawn is on this team, you know. I don't mm -hmm. see any craziness happening in the draft where they're gonna trade him, but him, Paulson. 
and then obviously Alante, and then you know behind that, that's it's a little bit of a question mark. And of course, they're yep. going to draft people. I think there's still some wild cards that they can sign free agency wise, but. Again, it's a, a, I guess, a low risk, high reward type signing, if you will. And uh, I think it's it's one that, again, it's not going to set the world on fire like a Chase Young or or a Willie Gay Jr., but it's necessary. You got to build out your 90 man roster somehow. And so that's one of those moves. But speaking of some of the other ones that was really interesting, uh, let's start with Equinemia St. Brown. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, we got to talk to him a little bit, but a guy, he's the older brother of Amon Ra St. Brown. And, you know, he spent time in Chicago. Uh, Andrew Janoko was a big part of him coming over. He actually reached out to his agent, he told us, and mm -hmm. was why he can come. He's a guy. It's a physical style receiver. He played with the Packers before, but, you know, in the Bears the last couple of seasons, potential possession guy. But, you know, we're going to get ahead of ourselves maybe there. But what do you see in him and what do you like about the signing? Yeah, I think that he's one of those players that can come in and compete along with A.T. Perry, compete with Cedric Wilson to either hold you know, an X receiver spot or a big slot spot, which is about to come really important in this New Orleans mm -hmm. Saints offense with the shift of the scheme. Or let me rephrase that. It's about to become again important in this New Orleans Saints offense. It used to be a big, <laughs> big focus in yeah, their offense. Huge. Guys like Marcus Colston, guys like Michael Thomas made a living nice there. Man. Mm -hmm. Lance Moore as well, like those bigger body guys that can block in the slot. You want to have that in wide zone because you want to extend the offensive line out as horizontally as possible so you can start to attack laterally in the run game. And so you want to have those big body guys that can go out there, climb up, block a linebacker, block a safety, block a nickel corner or whatever, and then try to isolate the one outside boundary corner because you'll take your running back on an outside boundary corner 10 times out of 10. And so having these guys that are able to help to contribute from that area helps a ton. Equity BSA Brown coming in at six foot four, 214 pounds, had 448 speed when he came into the NFL back in 2018. I don't think that that has changed very much. Uh, so he's somebody that will be able to go out there and compete as a possession receiver, find ways to get out on the field uh, in any case as a blocking receiver, if he can prove that he can do both of those things uh, throughout training camp, right? This isn't a situation to where, you know, you sign a guy for a year and now you have to expect that he's going to be on the active roster. We'll see. He's going to get an opportunity to compete here, but there will be competition to be had. And uh, I think that's the most important thing is the Saints still trying to breed competition at every single one of those wide receiver spots where there's an opening. Yeah, I think he's going to, obviously, he's said it, he's going to get a fair shake here. And mm -hmm. and he's definitely a praise known more for his blocking, obviously. And and I think that you look at it, Lynn Bowden, uh, they wanted to re-sign him, but he's obviously was injured and had that off-season surgery. He's still somebody they could look at bringing back, uh, I think, obviously. And then, you know, I think it kind of reminds me of Brian Edwards last year. I, I mean, Edwards was somebody that could have worked out but didn't. Yep. But I think St. Brown's got more potential in him, a lot more potential in him. And so, again, I think uh, it really would would be interesting to see where he goes in camp. And, of course, I don't think they're done by any means uh, as far as the receivers. But you look at the – track history of who they brought in you know Cedric Wilson's supposed to be a little bit more Stanley Morgan's another guy and you know St. Brown now and and I think that it gives uh Coach Williams Coach Dub a little bit more to work with obviously and and I think it's going to be you know best man wins and so I'm looking forward to his second year of A.T. Perry I think that he can be that possession guy mm -hmm. I don't know that he can be that full-time basis. But again, I think you look at some of the tape last year and what he was able to do that there is promise there. And I think that he is a guy that can emerge a lot, but you know, we'll see where it happens and where it shakes out. But uh, I think it's exciting, you know, just that they're making these player signings. And again, it's not stuff that sets the world on fire, but a lot of the signings that they've had over the years, they don't make, you know, a huge wave or huge splash. And I right. think, Chase Young's one of the biggest that they've had in the past couple of years, you know, aside maybe Tyron, um, you know, coming back home and stuff. But mm -hmm. we'll see how that kind of plays out. But not only St. Brown, but signing a fourth quarterback. Technically, I guess you could say five if you throw in the Taysom now, but Kellen Mond, Andrew Janoko, and Clint Kubiak ties from Minnesota. They were there mm -hmm. in his rookie year when they took him in Minnesota. Interesting player he worked he played with eric mccoy uh, he also brought up that cesar ruiz was his yes. high school center yes at that IMG. was so random <laughs> yeah at IMG, like that was so random that he and he brought it up but tell him on a fourth quarterback what do you make of that and does he is he somebody that can challenge a nathan peterman or is he somebody that you just bring in to help teach this offense and maybe make Derek a, a little bit make his job a little bit easier like james did 
Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think the idea is that you bring in a guy that has familiarity with what that 2021 version of Clint Kubiak's offense was, which was a little bit like steakhouse menu dealing on the mm. Kevin Stefanski train of like six plays that we're really good at. Now it's just all about the sequencing kind of thing and stuff. And so that was kind of a little bit of what they were still doing post Stefanski, post Gary Kubiak, and then getting to Clint Kubiak. So I expect that there will be a more expansive menu that will be brought now that he's had that year with Shanahan, those years in Denver, all those other things, and it comes here. So I think that Kellen Mond can help to serve as the bridge between Derek Carr and uh, the new system, uh, the team and the new system, much like Peterman can as well, especially with his uh, experience with Chinoco. So I, I do think that there's a little bit of that sort of uh, additional – input additional insight angle with Kellen Mond but I do think that he's a guy that can compete with Nathan Peterman and with Jake Hayner to be that other quarterback um, and the thing that's really interesting is that with the NFL rule change this year your emergency third quarterback doesn't have to be on your active roster anymore it can come from your Correct. practice squad so yep. even if a guy like Jake Hayner ends up being the backup quarterback for Derek Carr which would be what I would call like the favorite for right now favorite as in like odds on favorite uh, sure. yeah. Kellen Mond could still compete to be the emergency third quarterback, land on the practice squad, and then be that guy for the New Orleans Saints each week as long as he stays on the practice squad. So there's kind of three different ways that he can end up kind of showing his value, and now he has two different ways to being an active or very important part of the roster in 2024. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see how they use that to construct the final roster. I know it's way too mm -hmm. early, but, you know, I remember the days where they only carried two quarterbacks. And so right. I don't know if they're there again because Derek's had some bad luck in that aspect. But, you know, if a Jake Hayner is able to win the backup job and then they can choose out of Peterman and Mon to be on the practice squad potentially and be in that emergency role, that would be something to, to keep an eye on. But, yep. you know, it'll be a and numbers game. Got, I expect them. Yeah, and you've always yeah. got Taysom that can slide in there somewhere Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we forget about Taysom, which, again, his his name keeps coming up. It keeps being thrown out to Denver. I don't get it. It's about as much garbage as I've seen about this Derek Carr crap about being traded to the Cowboys. Oh, that like, was the worst. Know, that, that was, was the, the worst. stupidest thing I've ever heard <laughs> because there was no mention of a no-trade clause, which Derek has all the power on, right? And right. so I, I, it's a boring season, and so uh, that's why I tell people it's like, you got to stop believing what you see on Facebook. It's the worst. And people yeah. are just trying to do it for attention. But yeah, I digress. But yeah, Taysom and, and Alvin. And again, we've heard it for months, Ross, that these two are going to be a part of the, the offense in 2024. That's not going to change magically. I don't see them mysteriously making this package deal with Taysom, um, you know, to potentially do it. And, and again, we've said it on the show. They had the new coaching staff went in and assessed the saints players before everything. And they had a positive review of them. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't see it, but I think people are just going to manufacture this as much as they can until it's almost as bad as the Sean Payton, the Dallas crap that happened like every <laughs> single it's year. Just, they Sean just changed the name. De right. they, just, they ripped off Sean Payton's name and then stuck Derek Carr's name over to Dallas. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> and then it takes him to Denver. And now Marshawn's going to go. So I, I, I mean, I never say never, but yeah, go right. ahead. Yeah, there's always a chance of like some type of like godfather yeah. offer coming through or whatever. Right. But until we actually see that, there's no reason to speculate that's the case because that's always the case while trades are able to be made, right? It's always the case that there could be some offer. So we're just right back to square one, basically. And I think what people are doing is that they're over, they're they're reacting to the fact that they didn't, that the Saints didn't restructure Alvin Kamara, that they didn't mm -hmm. restructure Taysom Hill, that they didn't restructure Jawan Johnson. Well, actually, no one's talking about Jawan Johnson, but the, the other two are the ones that that everybody's talking about, like didn't get restructured. And it's so funny. Right. We're so used to seeing the New Orleans Saints restructure contracts that when they don't restructure a contract, it must have some big hmm. negative meaning when really in my eyes, and, and I and, and tell me if you disagree, it's a part of getting right with the cap. It's a part of what Mickey Loomis has been saying that they're trying to that they've been trying to do over the course of the past, what he said that last off season. If I yeah, remember correctly, and his like, yeah, yeah, and stuff, and trying to get under there, his end of season presser, he also said it, and so it's part of the not making the decision to kick the can down the road where it makes sense, but not feeling pressured to always kick the can down the road. So like with Tyron and with Demar, so Tyron Matthew and Demario Davis on so the defensive side, the older guys, older guys uh, on the roster, they didn't restructure those contracts necessarily. They kind of 
kind of adjusted the pay, tweaked them, and then gave them an extra year uh, on the deal. And then with AK, with Taysom Hill, and then with Juwan Johnson, they just haven't restructured those contracts. It doesn't mean that they won't. They just haven't yet because maybe they don't feel the need to at this moment. But if there's a move that's that's able to be made or something like that, then they have those three contracts they can fall back on, restructure to create some space. If not, then you can play on the contract without it being touched, and that's less money that you've kicked into your future years. That's what this feels like to me, as opposed to a some kind of you know, uh, oh, a move is imminent or 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 something like that. Yeah, and everybody's got to remember after the draft, a lot of these free agents are waiting to see what the situation is. Yep. You're going to see a lot of premier guys sign in May and June. That's just how it is, especially key veterans that are still out there. I mean, we talk about Justin Simmons all the time, but it's not him, just him. Makai Becton's still out there. I mean, there's a ton of players that are still available that could still end up being on the Saints team. It just depends on you know the financials, and it's been a minute since I've checked how much space they had, but they've got enough to sign their draft class and then have enough to do undrafted class, and that's usually the space that you yep. want to be in that you have enough money to do that. But you know they've got nine picks to make. The top thirty visits are happening right now. We can kind of run down some of the ones we've reported. A couple of them, um, you know, Eric All from Iowa was one recently, uh, Rico Payton from Pittsburgh state. And that's in Kansas just so mm-hmm. everybody knows. And yes, then, uh, yes. <laughs> Marshawn Lloyd from USC. Mm-hmm. What do you like about these three prospects? And of course, let's just pre- preface this just because they have somebody in for a top 30. And if you didn't catch our show last week, Ross explained everything about a top 30 visit, what it is, what it's not, but a guy like Eric all a chance to check his medicals, but it doesn't yes. mean that they're going to draft these guys. But last year, of the guys they had in, they did draft Kendra Miller and Jordan Howden. But your thoughts on all, and you could talk about Peyton and, and uh, Marshall Lloyd too. Yeah, uh, all is one that's really interesting because he is this hyper athletic uh, uh, tight end that we just haven't gotten the opportunity to see much of because of injuries yeah. and everything. So like, doesn't have much testing over the course of the off season and all those other things. Uh, but man, he's a fun prospect. He is a good build at the position as well. He's just one of those dudes that like makes a lot of sense if he ends up being able to show that he can stay healthy. But the biggest thing is, can he stay healthy, right? That's going to be the, the, the toughest thing that he'll have to prove. Uh, so coming out of Iowa, he's got a lot of opportunity. So if he can check the boxes on those medicals then that's awesome and then maybe we'll see exactly where all that goes but uh, up until then it, 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 it's a tough one to kind of project uh the other guy that i that i really like in this group is is marshawn lloyd uh because for me i look at marshawn lloyd as like a little bit of a he's kind of marking Ingrammy um in that way he's like a power mm. runner and all that he's the type of guy that's going to be able to you know run between the tackles and um, you know, pick up a ton of yards, pick up yards after contact, all of that. Uh, last year, I'm just pulling up his stats here. Last year, he finished with uh, 816 rushing yards. He's not been a high volume back, which is something that the New Orleans Saints actually like. They don't really like to draft running backs that have seen a, too much action. They want a lot of tread on the tires. So with only 115 attempts last year, only 110 the year before that, and only 64 the year before that, there's a ton of tread left on those tires. And make no mistake about it, even though he only had 115 and 110 carries in the last two seasons, nine touchdowns on the ground in each of those seasons as well. So he turned those into uh, a ton of yards. So he's this interesting blend of being sort of this man gap scheme runner but that also has really good elusiveness and really good athleticism uh at five foot eight 220 pounds you see where the the mark ingram comparison came in there mm-hmm. uh he also has like four four eight four four six speed something like that as well so he ran in the four four area uh in the 40s so he's got good long speed has the vision to be able to run inside has the breakaway ability and has the sort of that elusiveness that you need as well as kind of a one cut stick your foot in the ground, Latavius Murray, turn up and, you know, get north and south mm. kind of quickly and stuff. So he's the one that I, I saw that I was like, oh, that could be a really interesting fit because you do need to be ready for your days post Jamal Williams, your days post Alvin Kamara. And if Kendra Miller is going to be the post Alvin Kamara guy, who's your compliment to Kendra Miller? You could find that guy in this year's draft, next year's draft, whatever. But Marshawn Lloyd could end up being a guy that could fit that role this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at it, I, I, I like all three of them. And, you know, Eric All, uh, Iowa's got some good tight end lineage. Obviously, that's a, a right. tight end factory. And mm-hmm. so I like that. And, and, you know, I think it's just obviously medicals because it was the back and then I think is the ACL, if, if I'm not mistaken. And so 
he's a, an intriguing prospect and he's drawn a lot of interest. And so I think when you look at tight end and I think it's a legitimate need, you know, for this team, and no matter what happens, I think they need somebody that can take this to the next level. And we've talked about whether Jawan's going to be that next guy or they maybe draft somebody to help with it. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think Eric all is a guy that is very intriguing, very fascinating. You look at Rico Payton. He was a transfer from Illinois, uh, yeah. Southern Illinois. And he's somebody who plays on one of the best college logos I've ever seen, the Pittsburgh State Gorillas. But, <laughs> you know, so good, uh, he dude. played in the MIAA <laughs> uh, Mid-Intercollegiate All-American Conference, I believe. I, I might have butchered that. But, you know, he's a guy six foot-ish in about 180, 190 range, a cornerback. and you know, he look, he's, he's made the, the all team, you know, all first team honors, second team honors and stuff, captain over there. Just somebody that you look at and say, maybe this guy might not get drafted. Maybe he does get drafted late. Always look at these guys. He's yep. also garnered a lot of interest. You know, I was told the AFC team had him on the top 30 visit. They've had a lot of teams that were interested in a small school guy like him. He's just one to keep an eye out on. And, you know, Saints like their small school guys. At some point, they're mm-hmm. going to get somebody from a small school. Don't know when. Hopefully that's not an edge rusher because they just haven't had any good luck with that. But, right. you know, at the same time, uh, you know, he's somebody to keep an eye on. And, and I like Marshawn Lloyd. I love the con- the idea of bringing in another running back. And, and mm-hmm. so I think there's guys that, you know, maybe on that day three range, like a Jarvion Howard or a Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State, yeah. some of those guys I really, really, I like really, really like. And so I, I think that the, it begs the question, Lloyd, you know, it could be as obviously looking at probably day two, obviously, because the running mm-hmm. back class is just not that good this year. But right. I think he's somebody that would you look at it, the Mark Ingram style, that is something that you have. And, and you mentioned, you know, Mark and – uh, it was just fun because I, I was feeling nostalgic him and Latavius Murray. I was watching them and, and like Mark took it to another level, you know, mm-hmm. when he was in on his game and from that 2017 stretch on for a little bit and Latavius stepping in that one year, like, I mean, they need to have that ground game back, which is something that they've just kind of lacked a little bit. And obviously I think another running back in that, that committee, if you will, will help for sure. But you know, I think that uh, the running back side, it, it, all three of those are positions of need. You know, they're going to get cornerback. They're going to find tight ends somehow. They're going to find out and try to get, uh, you know, a more running backs in the room at least, even though they mm-hmm. have some guys like Jordan Mims we want to see more of, James Robinson we want to see more of. But, you know, the small school stuff, I mentioned that. A couple of guys that are really kind of rising up the ranks right now. Your guy, Malachi Corley, for starters. Mm-hmm. You talked about him last week, but a Marshawn Nealon is another one that's, yeah. that's rising up the ranks, too. Your thoughts on Corley? Because people are comparing him to Debo Samuel. He's a guy that broke all these tackles, and he's like, you know, he says on social media, you know, who was the guy that was above me that broke more tackles than I did and stuff type thing? So he's a fascinating prospect. I could see him in this offense. I think every 32 teams could see him in this offense, right? Yeah. But where does he go? And then talk about Marshawn Nealon a little bit, what you like about him. Yeah. So with Corley, he could be one of those guys that's, we'll call him day two, right? He could be as early as the second round if somebody falls in love with him. Saints at 45, for instance. I don't know, just throwing it out there. And then, you know, at 80, you know, in the 80s, you know, going into to round three, you know, getting all the way down into the top 100. So he's a top 100 selection, but I would probably consider him more like a 50 to 100, kind of like in that zone, and everything. So it's yeah. a prime opportunity for uh, a trade up, uh, which I did, I think, in my mock draft last week for Saints News Network. And I'm doing again in my mock draft this week for Saints News Network because I just, I, I, I think he's a perfect fit for what it is that the New Orleans Saints need. I think they need to figure out who that X receiver is. They brought a lot of options in there. They need a big slot. They have a lot of options in the building. And then they need a more full time slot receiver that is the type of guy that. Like Andrew Janoko, who came in as a New Orleans Saints quarterback coach, he's one of the the brightest guys in the NFL. And he is just one of these dudes that like really, really believes in the quick passing game. And when it comes to quick passing game, you need guys that are going to be able to take a seven yard slant for 60 yards if you need them, you know, if they if they get the opportunity. Malachi Corley has the ability to do that. He's got that average over nine yards after catch per reception uh, during his time at Western Kentucky. He also led uh, leads this draft class in avoided tackle percentage at over 39%. I think it's 39.6%, if I recall correctly. So this is what he does. He gets the ball in his hands. He breaks tackles. 
and he ends up picking up yards after catch. And even if you take the screen patterns out, right, all the screen passes that he caught at Western Kentucky, he still leads his class or is second in his class at wide receiver when it comes to yards after catch. So even getting away from the plays where he's designed to get yards after catch, he's finding ways to get those yards after catch. That's one of the things that I really like about him. People are comparing him to Debo Samuel, and I think that that's right. Like he is the Debo Samuel-like player. There's like three of them in this year's draft. Uh, yep. Xavier Worthy has – not Xavier Worthy. I'm sorry. Uh, Xavier Leggett, uh, Leggett yeah, has Leg a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Malachi Corley and then Tyrone Tracy, the running back out of Purdue who used to be a wide receiver for Iowa. Uh, all three of those guys have some level of that Debo Samuel-esque game, we'll call it, uh, in there. All of the expectations don't have to be that high. Um, as for Marshawn Nealon, now this one's a fun one. Western Michigan, right? He's a guy that Dane Brugler right now has, has in sort of the – round one round two grade area so you mentioned yeah. him kind of like bolstering up. quite a bit yeah he has been flying up big time six foot three 267 pounds 475 in the 40 yard dash here's what i'll caution you about when it comes or not caution you about here's what i'll tell you about why sometimes some of these players rise uh late just as a listener and as somebody that's like taking this in um the reason why you see a lot of guys arrive late, uh, like rise late like this, is because media starts to catch up to where the teams are at this point. Um, this is where you start to see a whole bunch of stuff to where you know Theo Johnson, who has been consistently spoken about as a fifth round tight end, is now going to be talked about as a third round tight end. Uh, guys like Marshawn Nealon, who were talked about as a day three guy, is now being hinted as a potential day one guy, early day two yeah. guy, all that. So we're used to seeing this Malachi Corley, somebody that was uh, you know relatively third, fourth round, now being talked about second, third round. That's what's happening here. Is that media is starting to catch up to where the teams are because the teams have been way ahead on this for a long time. They've been watching these guys for years and have been scouting for a very long time. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why you're seeing this. I don't think it's a situation to where all of a sudden one person fell in love and then there's this whole kind of like yeah. ripple effect. It's that we found out that the team has been in love with this guy for a while. So 13 career sacks, 28 tackles for a loss as well. Team captain, something I remember mm -hmm. there, you know, the New Orleans Saints love that. Uh, gotcha. Was, yeah, uh, played uh, 38 games with 23 starts over the course of his career. He's got good, uh, he's got good arm length too at 34 and a half inch arms, which you would usually want for your left tackle. So to have a guy off the edge that has that kind of length, it's really good. So Lincoln he's got strength. the tools. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's got the tools. He's got a little bit of that speed, all those other things. He's of the size right now that's maybe a little bit outside of the saints prototype but also very interesting to see how much they're going to be willing to adjust that prototype as they move into the next year with the success of guys like zach vaughn and caden ellis here in recent seasons absolutely and let's not forget he has the raft score everybody yeah, he loves that he does nine five four yeah now malachi corley's his was only what seven seven six seven, six something six, yeah i don't i mean i, I get that raft score and stuff but is it's that, really good when you're really trying to your Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really good if you're trying to project like the first round, but after that, like everything kind of becomes available and stuff like that. Right. So I'm with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So, but I mean, everybody makes the jokes that if uh -huh. you have a good RAS score, the Saints, it's in your bucket. It's a small school. He has the RAS score. You know, he, he checks the boxes, but, you know, of course, getting into our mock drafts, yeah, again, yeah. Offensive tackle seems like it's the prevailing pick. Alufashanu is still yeah. the top pick and, and such, but they're starting to see a little bit more difference. You know, I, I've seen guys like Brian Thomas Jr. I don't buy that one. I don't think that's going to happen. I, yeah. I just don't see that because this is a wide receiver class that is pretty deep. Or you can get a day two, day three guy and still come away with somebody good. I, I think somebody day three just spitballing like Luke McCaffrey is a guy that I really like mm -hmm. out of Rice. Yeah, Jaquan like Jackson out of Tulane. I mean, a local guy. I, I think there are some guys you can get still on day three that can continue to be like a pretty good playmaker for you. But, you know, 14, 45 for the Saints. You did a couple of two round mocks. I did two two round mocks. Let's start maybe with yours and, and kind of yep. see who did you take for number 14? We'll start there. Who'd you take for number 14 on, on both of them and why? 
Yeah. All right. So I uh, let me do my first. I did one that was chalk, and I did one that was like, <laughs> let's go. Let's do. Let's do something a little bit different here. So okay. The, cool. the the chalk one. I went ahead and I went with Olu Fashionu, just in case you didn't with your with yours. Uh. So I I, I went with Olu Fashionu. I also had the option to go with Troy Fatanu. I had the option to go with Talise Fuaga there. I had the option to go with uh, Brock Bowers there. Quinyon Mitchell. Uh, a couple Oof. of other corners and stuff like that. All easy for me to pass on. Olu Fashionu, the only player that I would pass on Olu Fashionu for is Dallas Turner. That's that's literally it. Outside of those that are like projectable, right? Obviously, something crazy happens, something crazy happens. But uh, Olu Fashionu was my selection at 14. This guy is seen as somebody that can be and, and will likely be a perennial all pro at the next level. And if you have mm -hmm. the opportunity to add that to one of the most important positions on your team, you add that to one of the most important positions on your team. Your blindside blocker, your left tackle, might not be the guy that's facing the premier edge rushers so much anymore that seems to have gravitated over to the right tackle side quite a bit here in recent years, but you're still protecting the blind side. You still have a massively important job. Um, he's a pure left tackle, better pass blocker than he is a run blocker. So like the exact opposite of Trevor Penning in that way, who was a better pass blocker, but needed to continue to work on the fundamentals of pass blocking. And this doesn't necessarily mean you have to give up on Trevor Penning. There are things that you could potentially do with Trevor Penning in terms of moving around and things like that, trying him out elsewhere, whatever it might be. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to add an Olu Fashionu, you add an Olu Fashionu and you add an all pro player to your roster. So that's why I went with him at 14 in my first more chalk uh, selection. So who's your different one in your second one? Because I went oh, with the same yeah. player in both of mine, but go ahead oh, and okay. share. Who'd you go? Yeah, so for my second one, I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit different and show that you can still get a starting tackle or starting offensive lineman in the second round. So that was the goal like of this it. one. So yep. for this one, I went with Johnny Newton, the defensive tackle out of Illinois. Mm. When mm. you look at this team, this team wants to build and win through the trenches. It's a defensive head coach. It's a team that expected to be much better against the run last year than it turned out being. Uh, and a guy like Johnny Newton can come in and help you clutter up the middle of the field, can help you add another long-time pass rusher on the interior next to Brian Brzee. Johnny Newton was my first-round pick for 2023 until mm -hmm. he declared, he until he said yep. that, yeah, until he decided to go back to school. And so then it was like, oh, great. Well, then Brian Brzee is the 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 first round pick that's easy and so now there's a reality in which the saints could have brian brzee and johnny newton on back-to-back -back years and i don't think that that's a bad decision i think defensive tackle is the other position that maybe people aren't looking at enough as a potential Correct. first round selection for this team it's there's there's yeah. real potential there for them to do that especially for a guy that can impact the game the way that a johnny newton can yeah, I, I and I wrote about it this morning too, just talking about mm -hmm. the defensive tackle spot. I, I think it could be, you know, I think Byron Murphy is a guy to keep an eye on, you yep. know. Uh, but you look at last year, what it was, Brzee was one of the popular ones, but Mozzie Smith was the other one. And I think there was one more, but Mozzie Smith was one that they really, everybody was trying to mock them. Brzee was a guy that I think we all kind of centered on, or at least, mm -hmm. you know, me and you, it centered on and stuff. But I, I like the thought process because I think defensive tackle is a, a pressing need because you look at it right now, if they were to play a game, Jack Heflin is your number four guy, right? right. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing because this is a guy who in the XFL played for Bill Johnson, former Saints defensive line coach and, and such. And so he, he played a little bit for the team. And so I, I think the big question is, you lost Malcolm Roach, somebody who was great against the run, could get after the, the passer. You have to backfill. You have to find that next Malcolm Roach. And Malcolm mm -hmm. was an undrafted guy, too. I'm not saying they, they should definitely lean on that, but right. that is a very impressive or impressing need for the team to go and address the interior defensive line. At some point, I think that it is something you can get into day two and, and somewhat early in day three and still come away with some pretty good guys. But, you know, guys like Murphy and, and, and Newton, they, those are the top of the class, right? I think those are the mm -hmm. guys that you look at. So I like that pick. Um, For me, I went with the same guy in both of them. And I'm telling you, he is my, probably my favorite guy that the more I look at him. It's JC Latham of, of Alabama. Oh, interesting. I have picked him twice now, and he is probably my guy to take. Now, I'll say this. I think I, I based that on a couple of things. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I think Trevor Penning's left tackle. I, I, he's mm-hmm. going to be the left tackle. They're going to try to make this work. I think they're going to make this work, right? It may be strugglesome, but I think they're going to give him the benefit of the doubt and put him at left tackle. That's why, you know, Olu or Fotano, all those guys, I like them. I like Olu because, again, he's got the power. There are some things when I look at him on film that I, I think there's just some subtle things to his game from a technique perspective that he just needs to clean up. But this guy is just a stone wall. Now with Latham, I love his power. He's a guy is a true right tackle. Alabama, he's just a mean and nasty mauler, right? He's a guy that when I look at the Saints run game, he's about 360. I I forget what the exact weight is. Yeah, 360. I look at his, um, his, his physicality off the right side. And he's athletic for his size too, but just with his ability to pull, his ability to push, his pass rush, uh, pass blocking skills, I'm telling you, this is my guy, right? Like mm, if I'm making a mock draft right now, I get the Olu love. I, I I think that they'll be happy no matter what. Yeah, I think that offensive tackle is probably where they go in number fourteen. But Latham is my guy. I really like him a lot. If you go look at the tape. You look at some things on it. And one of the things I really liked, and, and shout out to Mike Martz, um, he did a really mm. good breakdown of Joe Alt, Olu, and uh and and, and you know JC Latham. Mm-hmm. I just think Alt is is a little bit I, I'm I'm don't know about Alt. I don't know if he's gonna translate to the next level. Like he'd be as powerful and as strong as everybody thinks he's gonna be, right? I think there's some things to his game where, you know. I could see him struggling a little bit, right? I think he'll be fine at the end of the day. Ole's mm-hmm. going to have a good career, but Latham is my guy. I really like him. I really think the offensive line is going to get better with Ryan Ramchek. I think right tackle is your need there, unless they're thinking Landon's going to be your full time guy for something, which is is not a, a bad thing. I think Landon is capable, but I go with a little bit more power and more beef on that side because mm-hmm. the Saints' running game has got to come back to life. Yep. I really like running that right side with Ramchek. He's my guy. I love it. I love it. That's that's one that I don't usually gravitate towards because of because of the size and sort of the uh, I, I have concerns about the ability to you know move at the speed that you need to be able to in this system and everything like that. But I will say he came in slimmed down. He was playing right. at 360 at the combine. He came in at 342, so he came in a little bit more of a, a sort of, you know, kind of shows that he has control over over what that is. He kind of proved that in college too. He yep. purposefully added that weight on when he moved up to 350 and all that. So I do think that there's something good there. And the other thing that I do like about Latham a lot is the arm size, 35. Yes and an eighth inch arms uh that's insane like that's insane reach that's puncher's reach right there that's tyson reach you know (laughs) you go look at his film he just stops people in his tracks i mean he's just be able to pull them out i mean and again i i think offensive tackle if they get either of them if they even get fatanu or any of the other ones they're gonna be happy fuaga oh yeah i mean they're gonna be happy with these picks it's just a question of do you take it at 14 or do you wait until 45 to try to get somebody different? And so, um, oh, look, here's another one. This guy, this is your guy. This is the I was I, just about to talk about both these this guys. This is your yeah. guy in second round for <laughs> sure. But uh, before, uh, let's move on to the second, 45. Um, and of course, before we do that, first round, I think the quarterback run, the amount of quarterbacks they're going to take benefits the Saints. I don't yeah, think they're going to have to trade up. I really don't, I don't think either. they're going to have to trade up in this one. I think they can stand put and and be able to come away with it. I just want to add that caveat. But second round, number 45, things get a little bit interesting here. Who'd you take in both of your mocks? And why? Okay. So in my chalky mock, which is the one where I took Olu Fashionu in the first, uh, the second – round i thought about going back to the defensive trenches and going with chris braswell the defensive end okay. for out of alabama that was still on Love the board it. but i moved on and I, I didn't go that route and instead i went with uh south carolina wide receiver Xavier Leggett. this is one of those selections that is like Michael Thomas level selection in the second round right to where you pick up this wide receiver that for some reason isn't getting the love that the other wide receiver, like the rest of the wide receiver class is getting. I think Dane Brugler had Leggett as his like 14th wide receiver or something like that. Let me make sure. Yeah. Yeah. 14 wide receiver, 14 behind like Troy Franklin. And now Jalen Polk out of, out of Washington, I actually really, really like, and he's the, probably the wide receiver at the top of this class. It's not being talked about enough. Uh, but mm. 
Uh, for me, like Xavier Leggett is a guy that you can just get the ball to and let him create. But he sense. can also yeah. play an X receiver type role. He can play a perimeter role. He can operate out of the slot. It's just a really good complement to Chris Olave and, and Rashid Shahid and all that. So I really like what you're able to do with him and the fact that you can run him out of your backfield if you want to, as well as in the slot and on the outside. There's just so many different things you can do with him. Like we mentioned earlier, he's one of those – I want to be careful about throwing the name around too much, but he's one of those, um, whatever Debo Samuel's position is, he can play that position. That's, that's the way that I'll say it. So whatever the Samuel is in this offense, that's a guy that <laughs> can like, be the Samuel. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why I went with him in the second round. Now in the non chalky one, just because I wanted to be able to kind of show, that you could still get a starting offensive lineman in the second round if you don't do that at 14. At 45, I did go with uh, BYU tackle Kingsley Sua, uh, Sua Mataia. So the reason why I went with Sua Mataia is because you can move him around all over the place. Now, as, as the commenter here also mentions uh, Talese Fuaga in the first round, Talese Fuaga would be my JC Latham, right? He okay. would be the yep. guy that I would go to if I, I wanted like him. to draft. No, I you do know? Like him. Yeah, if I wanted that right tackle. Boom, easy selection, mm-hmm. and and also J.C. Latham. So that's that's where I have Fuaga. But for me, Suo Mataia is just one of those guys that's like stupid athletic, and you can move him around. He can play in a whole bunch of different places. The cousin of Pene Sewell, um, mm. and so he's a part of that you know bloodline that just keeps cranking out really really good offensive linemen. Six foot four, three hundred and twenty six pounds, thirty four and a quarter inch arms means that he can play tackle means that he can play on the interior. Uh, his 504, if I remember correctly, I think his I think his 40-yard dash was the area code. Um, and so when you have that, <laughs> that's just, you know, you have the athleticism of a guy that's able to kind of play in the scheme that the New Orleans Saints are going to want to install when it comes to their ability to run the football in this wide zone, uh, in this wide zone offense. And as a, uh, as a pass blocker, he was a little bit stronger than he was as a run blocker, but coming into the league at just 21 years old, he's going to have time to continue to develop. Yeah. I like that. I, I think that he's somebody that you look at, he's got the rest. So does Leggett. He's, they both yeah. have that rest more that you like to, but, um, it, I, I I could see it, you know, again, somebody that's versatile, the saints like versatility. You don't just play one position for this team. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. you've seen it over the years where guys have to kick inside, learn inside outside. I mean, yep. this is a norm for this team. And, and I, I think with John Benton, the new offensive line coach, again, I wonder if that's going to carry over. I wonder if that's something that's still going to be a staple for this team. That's a good point, John. That's really good. Like, yeah, we don't know just how don't much know. that's going to change everything. Yeah, I mean, we would think, we would guess it, it could be because we've seen it over the years, but yeah. maybe they just say, let's stick to this position and, and train you here. But they've always cross-trained a lot of these guys. And so, I, again, I like I like the picks. I, mm-hmm. I really do. I think if you if you went, you know, Olu in the first round and Kingsley, uh, or I'm not Kingsley, but and Xavier in the second round – Fans have got to be happy about that. I think it yeah. addresses two big needs. You can still get your defensive tackle. I, I see them trading up in the third and fourth to get those picks. I, again, that's coming on on uh, Saints News about you know how easily they could get on that pick. And one other thing I point out about defensive tackle that I wrote about today is I think there's an element to where they can actually trade for a player, a day three trade. You know what I'm saying? Like a yeah, King yeah. Contavious Street was a guy that you traded last year or Leonard Williams. I think there's that element that comes into play where you could potentially trade for a defensive tackle. So I think that's another thing to, to throw uh, out there potentially mm-hmm. as a, as a thing. Uh, let's read this comment real quick before I dive in some recent trend of Corley to the saints has grown on me because he reminds me of Debo Samuel and maybe Kubiak can use Corley similar. I mean, yeah, of course. Yep. <laughs> I think yep. there's an exciting element to that. And, you know, I, I, I but Spot I on. wonder, here's my question for you. Can Rashid Shahid do that? Is that a guy that could do that? That's one of those big questions. For me, I think the big difference is that like Rashid is a threat with the ball in his hands from a from a finesse standpoint, but who do you have that can be the physical yards after catch guy? And I think that those two roles are a little bit different, but I am curious about Rashid Shahid getting more opportunity. We saw it early, like against the Titans, 
they ran those routes with him out of the backfield and stuff like that. And then they just stopped last year and they like just never used that again. And so I'm curious about how much that maybe grows and allows Rashid Shaheed to have a bigger, even bigger offensive role so that he does so much more than just the deep field stretcher. Like he has so he has so much more ability than that. And so it could be really interesting if he finally gets the opportunity to be able to do more of that. I don't know why they went away from that last year, but for whatever reason they did. Well, I mean, the offense, I mean, we're talking about a team that couldn't install play action and work on the red zone until late yeah, in the right. season. Stuff. I mean, right. this is, and it's not a shot at, at Pete Carmichael or anything like that. I just, I, it, I don't know why it took so long to use those kind of elements. And so I, I think that's one of the things that, everything we've heard uh, from Dennis and Mickey, it's going to be more play action. It's going to be more motion. It's going to be all those things. And you got to have uh, guys that are mm-hmm. fast and, and have that knowledge to do it. And so again, I don't think Rashid's a guy that can't do it, but it begs the question, a guy like Corley is slippery out of the backfield, can break the tackles, all that fun stuff. He's an exciting prospect to watch. And so, and then we'll get a possession guy. I think that makes a ton of sense for sure. Yeah. Ah, this is going to be fun because Brian's still in my thunder a little bit. Here's we'll talk about my. I knew you were going to do it. I knew, I knew you it. were going to do it. it. <laughs> First one I had, I went Jatavian Sanders from Texas in the second round. He is one of my favorite tight end prospects. Yeah, I, I love Eric. All I love Brock Bowers. I don't think they're going to get Brock Bowers. Although if he's there at 14, I really think you got to pull the trigger, but Jatavian Sanders is a guy that I really love out of Texas, super freakishly athletic. Again, if you look at a RAS score, it's not going to set the world on fire, but I love the fact that Sanders, and he's a guy that is all over the draft board, right? I've yeah, seen him in yeah, day yeah. three pick. I could see him as a day two pick. It's just one of those that I think that when you look at it in the Saints, I think the tight end need is there. They need somebody who's a playmaker because they've got the blocking set with Foster, right? I think Taysom is a guy that can set the blocking as well, even though he can catch passes. Juwan can do both, but I think Juwan's got to get better. It got you got to get used more in the passing game. Not necessarily get better, but got to be used more in the passing game. But a guy like Jatavian Sanders, man, I, I think he's a, one of my favorite tight end prospects in this draft aside Brock Bowers, because he's just in a a league of his own. But I I think Sanders, man, I think he can change it up for the Saints offense. And I think it's a very exciting and like defensive tackle. I think tight end is a legitimate need for this team, you know? Yeah, no, it absolutely is. I think that's a place that you still want to add some of that. I do think that there's, there's kind of, um, um, there's, Bowers and Sanders, and then there's just this big drop off between you get to the other guys, right? Um, Theo Johnson is probably the next step there. I like Theo. Uh, Yeah, I do too. Uh, And then after that, you're going to get to some guys in the later rounds that could be very good for you, but you're drafting them for one specific purpose. Tip Ryman out of Illinois, uh, Tanner McLaughlin out of Arizona. Uh, Both of those guys are bigger blockers right and outstanding blockers but you would have to kind of engage them a little bit more as pass catchers or you grab like the ben sennett's from you know k-state who is a better pass catcher but needs to develop as a blocker and all those other things so if you want to get a guy that's going to be most ready most immediately you have to find the guys that are able to do both and sanders is one of the very very few tight ends in this class that can do both yep i love it i i I really can see it now my other one, the more serious approach, because again, this team believes building from the trenches within. So second round, my pick, sticking with Texas, Tavondre Sweat. Oh, yeah. This mm-hmm. is my guy. I, I like love him as the interior guy. This is a guy who's 366 and runs a 527. It's insane. ridiculous. Ridiculous. It's insane. Ridiculous. He's a guy that can plug the run. He's athletic enough to get after the passer. I think even though the offseason stuff, we talked about this, the off the field thing, uh, Mm -hmm. was it last week? Maybe if that's going to hurt his draft stock. I don't think so. His interest is super, super high on it. One little nugget I will give you. He actually grew up a Saints fan. He grew up a Drew Brees fan. So not that that has any bearing. And not that that has any bearing on taking, but I just think that when you look at it, Sanders is a guy. I, I, I look at the future of this team because Colin Saunders and, and Nathan Shepard, they're going to the second year of their deal, and they've got the third year, which I, I think people don't get so excited about Shepard and Saunders, but I think that they played pretty well last year. I think and, so and, too, and we, yeah. 
that they have to get better against the run just as a defense, right? But a guy like, you know, putting him in, you know, even if they put uh, Tavondre and, and Colin in the middle on run stops, I mean, that's that's crazy to think about something like that. And I just think Tavondre, no matter what team he's going to go to, I think he has an ability to change uh, the landscape for that defensive line. And so mm-hmm. that's my guy in second round. I, I would go – Latham in the first, I would go to Vondre in the second. And again, I like your thought process, but like you said earlier, going defensive tackle first too, and then mm-hmm. going offensive tackle. I think either one can work for this team, but I do think that there is a wild card to be said of a wide receiver or a tight end. But I think sticking with the trenches does seem like the smart and logical thing to do. But what do you think about Devondre? I think he's fantastic. I think about him as like a a more athletic Norman Hand almost mm, just because like you get one. you know you get that the the remarkable size in you know that's there for sure to kind of clog up the middle but then he's not just a run stopper. He can do so much more and he has the ability to be able to you know interrupt as a pass rusher. He's got a wicked good spin move too which complements you know Brian Brzee. we saw that at the he senior is. bowl. Um, yes. that he just does senior a lot of, guy. yeah, right. And <laughs> he's a senior bowl guy, which, yeah, senior yeah. Bowl guy. A lot of these guys are senior bowl guys. Oh. Mm-hmm. And so, um, that's one of the things that I think is, is great about him too, is that he just has this pass rush arsenal that you don't expect from a player of his size, which the saints have already proven. They, they have interest in and that they, they really like, uh, and then his, uh, arm length at 33 inches is like right where it should be, uh, for a defensive tackle. So really, really good stuff there. I I like him. I like him over some of the other kind of like rising guys that have, you know, become, um, that have become available and everything or, or that are, you know, finding their ways up and all. And then there's a little bit of the drop off there. So, and I think it's a defensive tackle. I meant tight end um, because he's mm-hmm. got the wingspan to be able to like go up and make some of those contested catches and all those things too. He actually recorded the single season school record for catches by a tight end uh, a couple of years ago with Texas, which has been playing yeah. college football for a little while. A little bit. Yeah. The only <laughs> knock against, uh, yeah. And I think the only knock against Devondre is, is his RAS score sucks. I mean, it's yeah. like a four or something. I, I just good. realized that I, I completely transitioned from talking about Tavondre Sanders to, to or, or, or Jatavian Tavondre Sanders Sweat and, into and, Tavondre yeah. Sweat. And I just like went back and forth. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, Texas. But, it's okay. Yeah. I just like blended them both together. Uh, but yes, no, I do like a lot of what uh, a guy like Sweat would bring because of that size and the ability to just be the imposing, you know, force that that he is i'm gonna grab his arm length real quick because his arm length is the thing that i was really curious about when it came to his ability to be able to kind of like jump in and have that impact right away because i saw somebody ask a question about another guy that's kind of like a riser at defensive tackle that i'm not super high on Braden Fisk. Braden Fisk. Yeah, about? yeah. Braden yeah, Fisk. I'm, I'm a little yeah. bit concerned about him because 31 inch arms, just like way too short. But Tavondre Swift, 33 and a quarter. So yeah, exactly where you want your defensive tackle to be. Let me see if yeah, I can go I, rewire my brain now while while you talk. No, that's okay. Yeah, you plug it in. Stuff <laughs> we're winding down. So I mean, if you guys got questions, by all means, drop them in the comments and stuff. We'll be more than happy to answer them. But you know, again, I think when you look at this draft. They can trade into the third and fourth round. I think when you look at all those fifth round picks, I'm really excited about these fifth round picks. I know it's going to be hard for them to sit on their hands and not have a third or fourth round pick, but if they take all these fifth rounders, I know that round has really traditionally not been good for this team, but I think some of these fifth round picks that they can get based off some mocks, based off some things. That's why I mentioned guys like Jaquan Jackson or mm-hmm. Luke McCaffrey. There's even guys in the corners uh, or safeties that can be good. Like they have a lot of picks between that fifth and sixth round to take. But again, maybe they package some of them. I, I, again, we've talked yeah, about that, you can't that package the fifth and get into the third. You'd have right. to get something next year to get it. But I don't think the costs are too crazy for you to get into the third or the fourth but you might have to dip into next year to be able to do that. And so that's where you see the player movement. Sometimes that you have a player and this pick traded for a high pick and stuff, but you know, Leonard Williams is a prime example, but he wasn't yep. the only one. There's a lot of players that got traded, but you know, it, it remains to be seen, but of course the saints MO is to be you know, trade happy, if you will. And and I just don't <laughs> see them sitting on day <laughs> three without a pick until the fifth round after they make 
45 just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have to agree with that. And I think that a lot of those draft picks from 2025 should absolutely be on the table and ready for them to trade. There's no sweat in any of that. Like, it's fine. Um, and you can get some of those picks back as well if you ever needed to. Like, if you're if you're trading up next year's fifth or you know, if you're trading a next year's fourth or later you're in compensatory conversations where you might be able to get enough of something depending upon how compensatory formulas work out this year, which they haven't had a ton of opportunity with that, but we'll see. Uh, but anyway, you'd be able to do that or, you know, small trades for later on and, and things like that. Like, I think that there's absolutely possible. I wanted to ask you, was there anybody, I know it doesn't necessarily happen in the first round, but in the second round, was there anybody that you were really, really, really close to taking, but didn't take either time? Cause I definitely had one of those guys. <laughs> Man, you know, I, there was a couple of them that showed up. But I, I'll just read you some of the guys that were on my board um, mm -hmm. when I looked. And and so I think for me, or not going to show you, but I'll just tell you, you know, they, mm -hmm. they had Michael Penix on there. I wasn't really hesitant on that. Lad McConkey was one. Um, That's what I was that thinking was about. One. Uh, Adissa Isaac from Penn State mm -hmm. was another. Ruk Aurora, uh, I'm going to, or Aurora. Aurora. Uh, I can't even. Aurora. 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 Yeah. Yep. I can't it's, say it's it. like row, row, row your boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Rougarou or something else out or, you know, Chappelle show, he goes, Rob, Ron, whatever, when he's doing the 8th <laughs> Street Gangsters and all that stuff. But McConkie was probably my my one that I was looking at. I liked Leggett. I was looking at him heavy, but Lad McConkie is probably the one I'm looking at. I'm like, man, you know, if it's not a, a tight end, it's not like Sanders. Lad McConkie is a guy that I thought about really taking just because, again, I, I think that he's somebody that can translate to the next level. I like mm -hmm. his his abilities and stuff. I don't know if I like him more than Legat right now, but I know that McConkie's a guy that that should be an early day two pick for yeah. sure. And he's, it, but I, again, it begs the question: Can you get somebody like him on day three in the fourth round? Yes, you could potentially. Maybe it's not the shiny one, and I'm not saying that they're just as good as McConkie, but they have the potential to be. Yeah, yeah, I'm right there with you on that. Uh, the guy that was really tough for me to pass up. Both times was Tyler Newbin, the safety out of Minnesota. Um, mm, ah, there, Jordan Hound, man. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there, there's the cool storyline with kind of getting the safety tandem back together. And in fact, actually, in my next Saints News Network mock draft, I might make him my second round selection just to kind of talk about it a little bit. Uh, but I know yeah. Bob did a really great piece on him, if I remember correctly. And, you know, the idea of being able to, like, put those guys back together is part of it, yes. But the other piece of it is, you got to draft for now and draft for your future. And Newbin's a guy that would pair really well next to Tyron Matthew. He would be able to compete with Jonathan Abram. It wouldn't be a, a for sure thing, but we have the opportunity to compete there. And then you'd be set for your future with Jordan Howden and Tyler Newbin, two guys that already know how to communicate on the back end, two guys that are coming from systems that you know that you like, and two guys that are you know very good at what it is that they do and know how to complement one another. Versatile, can play down in the box and play deep, although they like Jordan Howden a little bit more as a post safety, a little bit more of a deep guy. And Newbin can play a little bit further down and roam the middle of the field and do all those things that he does really well. So I just think that you get somebody with like ball hawking ability there when there aren't a lot of ball hawking guys in this year's draft, like mm -hmm. period. Um, there's the chance to maybe take him in the second round. And Saints do like taking defensive backs in the second round, just like they like taking offensive linemen and defensive linemen in the second round. So and wide receivers. And so those are kind of the core four in the uh in the second round. So it's not super far outside of um outside of the, 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 the trends, if you will, uh, for new Orleans to yeah. make a selection like that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you, you brought that up. That's why Rook was so interesting too, from Clemson mm -hmm. pairing him back up with Brian Brazil. I, I, yep. I see it. I don't think yep. that's necessarily the right answer, but you know, I, mm -hmm. I think that it could be a possibility. I like that thought process for sure. Let's see. Read this. Jalen Carley's has been my favorite sleeper from the safety oh. long guy with great balls. Here, here's my thing about Jalen Carley's. My thing about Jalen Carley's is that he's probably going to be asked to move to linebacker at the next level. He's like 6'3", mm -hmm. 226 and everything yep. and, and put on weight. My on only, th yep. yeah, my only thing with him is that he doesn't change direction well. And that's big mm -hmm. for me when you play safety. But if I got you down in the box, I'm okay with that. Like if, if you've got, he's got good short area quickness. He just doesn't have the ability to kind of change direction, flip his hips, all those other things. And so it's tough when I'm asking you to like turn your back and run away from the quarterback because I need you to cover deep or whatever. But if I can get you down in the box, he fits extremely well. 
in that area. So like him, and there's another guy, Katano Ladapo out of Oregon State. Both of them have very similar styles of play, both of them similar sizes, guys that could easily translate to, you know, linebackers at the next level and all those other things. Like that's where I think that a guy like Carly's could make uh, a ton of sense, but uh, four five speed, which is good. Um, yeah, he came in at six two two twenty seven. Is just like powerful and just like one of these big like stocky safeties Freakish. that can absolutely yeah. play down in the second level. But I do like for him sure. Lot. Yeah, I think there's a ton of gems to be found in this draft, and so I'm Trey I, Taylor. I look forward to it. Yeah, Trey yeah. Taylor. Trey Taylor is <laughs> my favorite one. one of the Air Force. Jim Thorpe there award winner, so and many. he's like a seventh round selection. Like, please, anytime. Yes, yes. I mean, that's uh, you know, it'll be. It'll be a fun time, man. I, I I really look forward to it. And man, Ross, we've already hit our hour mark right now, and such. Good and enough. we stay on longer, but you know, <laughs> I, I have to do some radio real quick. But man, uh, guys, we really do appreciate you tuning in. We're gonna have more draft coverage, obviously, and it, it, it's gonna be out the yin yang. I think we're doing a full mock next week, right? Yeah, I think we're gonna maybe even try to do a simulator where we go through this. We're just trying to figure out because we don't want to get the the site that has like all the pop ups and yeah, crazy yeah. crap and stuff. So there's a couple of them out there, but we'll probably do that next week for sure and such. But man, uh, time flies. As always, want to give you a chance. What's coming up on Locked On? What are you about to write out? And then, uh, how's the women's flag football? going uh I going great women, because i know it's girls but it's women yeah yeah uh going great they uh wrapped up the second week into the third week now um lots of stuff coming up with studying the wide zone offense over on locked on saints as well as on saints news network and of course getting everybody ready for the draft so quick easy cool awesome good deal and then i'm still doing my preview for every position to make sure we look at all of them and so if you want to know who's day one day two day three clouds i've been looking at them drafted guys too i mean this is a a very interesting, plentiful draft for a lot of people. And so I, I'm really interested to see where some of these FCS guys go, some of these D2 guys, some of this, uh, the, the HBCU guys. I think mm-hmm. there's so many different ones out there. And so I'm really interested to see how this kind of shakes out. But look, draft is coming, whether we like it or not. Then they'll have rookie mini camp, three day event. We'll see what we got for, on the docket when it comes to the draft coverage and stuff. But next week, we'll, we'll be back with a seven round mock. For the saints and we'll be having some fun with that don't forget to like and subscribe and look i also want to mention too if you guys uh, know of any sponsors for us we are looking for that in that aspect training camps coming in california chance to get both of us and such so if you got anybody you know anybody hit us up send me a dm on twitter it is twitter not x i'm not going to call it x but it's an S- or me or ross or something and we'll hook it up man but that's going to do it for us today. On behalf of Ross Jackson, I'm John Hendricks signing out for another episode of Second and Saints. Y'all stay good.